So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Kayla Marie and I am a librarian with the San Mateo County Libraries. Uh, my favorite fermented item at the moment is garlic fermented honey. Um, so if you wanna share your favorite ferment in the chat, feel free. Um, but we appreciate your support for all of our author events. Um, join us in July. We have another author, um, Amanda Jayatissa's My Sweet Girl. So um, you can join us for that and we appreciate all of your support. Um, some quick housekeeping, your microphone and video will be turned off, um, but please feel free to use the chat and submit questions using the Q&A feature, the Zoom Q&A. And um, for those who'd like to access live closed captions for this event, click on the CC and then show subtitle. So uh, San Mateo County Libraries welcomes Sandor Katz, uh, James Beard Award winner, New York Times bestselling author and fermentation revivalist. Sandor is a self-taught experimentalist whose explorations and from fermentation developed out his overlapping interests in cooking, nutrition, and gardening. Besides fermentation journeys, he is the author of four previous books, Wild Fermentation, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, The Art of Fermentation, and Fermentation as Metaphor. His worldwide fermentation works workshops have catalyzed a revival of the fermentation arts. And personally, um, his books have been an inspiration to me since I picked up Wild Fermentation several years ago. I've been filling my cupboards with experiments of all types and sharing them with nearly everyone I meet. So I'm so glad to be here with you tonight and uh, welcome you to San Mateo County Libraries. All right. <clears throat> well, it's my pleasure to be uh, 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 with you all uh, this evening. And um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my um, new book, uh, which is um, Fermentation Journeys, uh, Sandor Katz's Fermentation Journeys. And um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, really leave the bulk of the time for, um, you know, interaction. So um, I, I, I see that a couple of people have already um, um, uh, uh, posted questions in the Q&A, but I'll do my best to, to, you know, answer questions. And, um, you know, I just feel like it's more interesting for you probably, and it's definitely more fun for me if it's interactive than if I just talk, which, you know, I can go on and on and on and talk about fermentation and fermented foods and beverages. Um, before I start, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you that my, my little refreshment as, as, as we talk is uh, miju, which is a Chinese style of fermenting rice into alcohol. Um, you know, something like sake, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I do have um, information about how to make miju and how to make sake in my, uh, in my uh, new book, Fermentation Journeys. Um, so anyway, um, I've always loved to travel. Um, and uh, when Wild Fermentation, my first book about fermentation, uh, uh, came out. This is the revised edition that came out in 2016, but there was an earlier edition that was uh, that has a green cover that came out in 2003. But um, when my book came out, I organized, um, you know, a rather ambitious cross the United States book tour. And, you know, because I was living in an intentional community without, you know, having a big monthly overhead and because uh, thanks to the community that I was living in, um, I had a network of friends all around the country that I could stay with. Um, uh, you know, I organized this really ambitious book tour and I, I spent most of five months uh, you know, traveling around the Southeast, the Northeast, the Midwest, and then out to the West Coast and up and down the West Coast. Um, and um, by the time I got home, and, and well, I mean, I just, I, I learned what I already intuited, uh, uh, which is that there's a lot of interest in fermentation. And, you know, people get interested in fermentation for um, lots of different reasons, but, um, you know, potentially anyone could get interested in fermentation because everybody has direct personal experience with fermentation because almost every person in almost every part of the world eats and drinks products of fermentation uh, uh, every day. Um, 
So, um, you know, it was, it was great fun for me just meeting people in so many different places who were interested in fermentation or wanted to learn more about fermentation or, you know, wanted to share, you know, their memories of what, what their grandparents had been doing in terms of fermentation or, you know, I met immigrants from so many different places who were eager to talk about uh, fermented foods or, or beverages of the places that they came from. And by the time I got home from that book tour, I started getting invitations to come and teach different places. And, um, you know, in a way, my book tour never ended. And, you know, I've been living the life of an itinerant fermentation educator ever since then. Um, and in the, in the early days, you know, that mostly meant uh, uh, um, uh, teaching in different places around the United States. And then over time, I started getting invited to Canada. Um, but then, you know, I started getting invited to further and further away places. And it was very exciting to, um, uh, you know, get to visit different places, uh, you know, especially doing this work. And, um, you know, of course, wherever I've traveled, I, 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 I'm not just teaching. I'm also um, eating and drinking you know, because my hosts are usually people who are very interested in fermentation. They, you know, often, uh, uh, you know, have special local regional fermented delicacies to share with me. Sometimes they bring me to meet producers where I get to learn how to make uh, uh, different kinds of fermented foods and beverages. But anyway, my, you know, my knowledge of fermentation, my repertoire of what I could make, uh, uh, you know, has been greatly enhanced by all of the traveling that I have, uh, you know, had the, the, the privilege of, of, of doing. And, um, you know, I, I always had in mind that, like, eventually I would write a book, you know, I, I've been taking notes and taking photos and, and, you know, this was sort of in my mind as something that I would eventually uh, uh, work on. Um, but, you know, I've been very busy. I've been very busy as an itinerant teacher of fermentation and, and with all of these travels. And, um, you know, there are, you know, many places in the world that I'm interested in visiting that I know have, um, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, deep and uh, uh, interesting histories of fermentation, um, you know, that I, that I figured like, oh, okay, I, I, have, I have these other places that I need to visit before I can begin to work on a book like this. Um, but then the pandemic happened. And, uh, you know, like so many people, I had all sorts of plans for 2020. I had plans to teach in Peru. I had plans to uh, teach in Iceland. Uh, I had plans to teach in Taiwan. Um, and I, you know, I had, I had all of these plans that got canceled. And suddenly, you know, I had all this time on my hands, like so many people. And, um, you know, I already had a sourdough that I was working with. So, you know, that didn't really make for, um, uh, you know, filling my, 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 my time that I was at home. So I decided to work on this book that I've been thinking about for years. And um, so, so, you know, that's the book that became uh, 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 Fermentation Journeys. Um, originally, I started with the idea that I would organize it geographically. You know, this was my trip to China, and these are some things I learned about. This is my trip to Colombia. These are some things I learned about. In the end, I came to the conclusion that, um, you know, my strength as a fermentation educator is the breadth of my knowledge and my ability to connect dots. And I ended up organizing it um, by... Uh, uh, you know, different realms of, of fermentation, different, um, um, you know, the word microbiologist uses substrates, different kinds of substrates. So simple sugars, vegetables, um, uh, you know, dairy, grains, beans. Um, so I organized the book this way, and then sort of with each type of thing you can ferment, you know, I, I, I had examples from different places in the world, but I was able to kind of use them to connect the dots. Um, there's nothing you cannot ferment. Like, you know, anything you could possibly eat can be fermented in a variety of ways. That doesn't mean that everything has um, equally prominent traditions of fermentation. Um, um, but, but you could potentially ferment anything you could possibly eat. And, you know, most anything has some kind of tradition of, of fermentation uh, uh, somewhere 
or if that specific thing doesn't, then something like it does. Um, you know, some of the things that I that I make all the time now that are you know things I, I learned about in the course of my journey uh, journeys um, um, that I wrote about in this book. Um, um, I, I've been I've been munching on these um, um, uh, 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 pickles. Uh, um, you know, these are just one, of the, the white one is a turnip, the, the pink one is a watermelon radish, but um, uh, um, they have been fermenting in a spiced brine. Um, the pink is from the watermelon radishes that I, that I added yesterday, but this is a, a Chinese style of fermenting vegetables called pao cai uh, that I first learned how to make from a woman who I met in Chengdu named Mrs. Ding. And so, you know, I have the recipe for Mrs. Ding's Pao Tsai uh, uh, in the book. And one of the things that's really cool about this is that it's a perpetual brine. So, I mean, this brine is about two years old. And, um, you know, once I have all the vegetables out, I chop up new vegetables and, it, and, and add them into it. And, you know, because salt migrates out with the vegetables periodically, I add a little bit more salt um, because the, the flavor of the seasonings in it migrates out with the vegetables. Periodically, I add more seasonings. Um, so, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing process. But, the, you know, the, 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 the core of, of the brine, you know, is a couple of years old. And, um, you know, there's a high density of lactic acid bacteria in there. So, you know, whereas the first batch of vegetables that I put in, I left in for several weeks, you know, now that it's mature, I sometimes put vegetables in for just a day or two um, um, and then and then take them out. Or sometimes I leave them in longer. It just depends how intensively um, um, I'm using it. Another great uh, uh, vegetable ferment that I've been making um, is something that, and, and I, sh I should just say in general that in this book, I mean, I explore a lot of traditional ferments from different places, but, you know, I also incorporate some, you know, real kind of cutting edge innovations that I've encountered. So, you know, um, um, you know, this, this vessel here, I'll, I'll pick it up because it's a beautiful vessel and it has these like nice little knobby handles. But it's got a paste in it. Uh, this this bright yellow paste is a paste of turmeric, turnips, and garlic with a little bit of salt. I also add a little bit of water so I can blend them down into a paste like this. Um, and then uh, I ferment the I fermented the paste itself for about a month. This was a couple of years ago, and and ever since, I just I bury vegetables in, in it, and then um, you know a week or two later, I I I, I pull them out. So here, this is a this is a this is a, a half daikon rat, uh, radish that that's been in there, but um, you know besides the beautiful pickled taste and the influence of the flavor of the turmeric on the pickle, and of course the color of the turmeric on the pickle. Um, uh, I, I mean, it, you know, these are just, you know, gorgeous and delicious pickles. And this too is a perpetual pickling medium. So, um, you know, I made this paste two years ago and, um, you know, I just continue burying vegetables in and pulling them out. And, you know, like the other brine, salt migrates out. So periodically I need to add more salt to it. Um, you know, also water from the vegetables absorbs into the brine. So it gets more watery. So periodically I put a little ladle in and try to remove some of that excess water and incorporate it into a salad dressing or a sauce that I make or or something like that, but just you know get it out of the of, of the fermentation um, um, environment. Um, you know, some of the things that I learned, I didn't go anywhere. They, they, they came to me. Like one of the things that, you know, really has become a regular part of my repertoire is uh, NEM which is a Thai name for fermenting, um, uh, uh, I generally use ribs, but fermenting pork uh, with a paste made of rice, cooked rice, raw garlic, and salt. 
And the significance of this paste is that, you know, the rice is all this concentrated carbohydrates. The garlic is a raw vegetable populated by lactic acid bacteria. When you put the paste on the ribs and then leave them out to ferment for a couple of days, what I do is I, I, I make the paste, I, I, I pick up each rib individually, coat the outside with paste, um, and then I put them all in a Ziploc bag and just leave it at room temperature for three to five days and massage it each day. But the significance of the paste is that it ferments. The lactic bacteria in the garlic start consuming the carbohydrates in the rice and produce lots of acids quickly. And those acids protect the meat and enable the meat to ferment. Um, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a great strategy for, for fermenting meat. And in fact, I have a whole chapter in, in, in this book, um, um, that's about, you know, different examples of fermenting meat or fish in rice. And of course, the most famous example of this is sushi. I mean, would you eat in a sushi restaurant that, that didn't have a refrigerator? Well, there were no refrigerators anywhere until about a hundred years ago. Um, um, and, you know, one of the traditional styles of sushi in Japan is narazushi, which is basically fermented sushi. And, and the rice functions as the carbohydrate, and which, which you need carbohydrates to produce acids, and acids are what preserve food from fermentation. So, so it's a very, you know, elegant and, and simple uh, uh, method of, um, you know, fermenting meat and, uh, and, and, and fish. Um, you know, not everything in the book is exactly a recipe. Um, you know, for instance, uh, um, you know, I, I, I have a section about, um, about making pulque, which is this wonderful beverage, uh, uh, from Mexico. That's the fermented sap of the maguey. Now, I know that, you know, many of you in California live in places where maguey will grow, but, you know, in most of the United States, including where I live, maguey, it's too cold for maguey to grow. Um, um, so, uh, you know, the idea of having a field of maguey from which you can extract enough sap to, to make a significant amount of pulque just isn't realistic. But, you know, you know if you have enough maguey, um, you know, the technique is, in all, all, is all in extracting the sap. And once you extract the sap, the, the, the fermentation is just spontaneous and fast. There's really like nothing you could do to prevent it from fermenting. It just spontaneously begins to ferment. But anyway, as I said, I can go on and on and it'll be much more interesting for you and much more fun for me if this is interactive. So um, uh, I wonder if, uh, uh, okay, so I, I, I see a question in the chat. What, it, what is maguey? Maguey is the same plant that produces tequila. It's also sometimes known as agave. Agave, I, I think, is is considered one variety of maguey, but it's a it, it's a it's a desert succulent plant with with spikes, uh, and it flowers once in its lifespan, which could be anywhere from about eight to twenty years, depending on the variety, and and it flowers once, and 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 when it begins to stock up, that's when the the people who make maguey um um you know remove the, the 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 central part of the plant and create the well where the where the sap will uh will will, will accumulate um <clears throat> okay are there any other questions yeah we've got lots um okay great so I just saw one um, in the chat about um, fermenting meat and just being nervous about fermenting meat. So is there anything that, any advice you have to alleviate the fear of fermenting meat? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, let me say that, you know, whereas, you know, one of the reasons why fermenting vegetables is so accessible, you know, and why I emphasize it so much is that, you know, it is as safe as food gets. Um, you know, after you ferment vegetables, they become safer than vegetables are raw. And I certainly hope that nobody listening, you know, just because we do occasionally hear about these 
food poisoning outbreaks related to raw vegetables. I hope nobody is like avoiding raw vegetables because, you know, they read four months ago that there was a salmonella outbreak uh, in onions or, or, or anything like that. But, but, you know, to whatever extent there, there can be risks in eating raw, raw vegetables, fermenting them makes them much safer. And there's, you know, virtually no case histories of illness or food poisoning related to fermenting vegetables. It's about as safe as food gets. You know, with, with, with meat and, and fish, um, you know, the, these high protein animal foods are just intrinsically a little bit more dangerous. And that doesn't mean that you can't work with them safely, but, you know, it just means that, you know, there's more potential for, for problems. But as with any kind of ferment, the most important thing is to make sure that you understand what kind of environment you're trying to create. So like one of the reasons why I find the, um, uh, you know, the, these rice-based fermentations of, of meat so um, uh, appealing is that it's really straightforward to me what kind of environment we're trying to create. The, you know, the rice is a source of carbohydrates and, um, you know, it is going to acidify uh, 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 the meat. And then furthermore, with this particular tradition of nem, um, uh, the meat is cooked afterwards. So, you know, you ferment these ribs and then, and then you cook them. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that people ferment meat. I mean, you know, almost everybody is, has eaten fermented meat. I mean, I meet all the people all the time who are like, oh, the one thing I would never eat fermented is meat. And I'm like, well, have you ever had a salami sandwich? I mean, salami is fermented meat and then we're eating it raw. Um, so it's, you know, it's fermented pork that, that we're eating raw and, um, and, and, it, and it's perfectly safe. But I would say like, you know, read my, read the section in, in each of my books after wild fermentation, I have some section about fermenting meat and art of fermentation. I have a section about it in fermentation journeys. I have a section about it, but you know, it's all about trying to describe the conditions for, um, for, for doing it, uh, uh, safely in certain far Northern places. You know, people just ferment meat doing almost nothing. Last winter, uh, uh, I was in the Faroe Islands, which are in the North Atlantic, sort of halfway between Iceland and Scotland. And on the Faroe Islands, they ferment um, uh, the, the legs of sheep um, into a wonderful food that they call uh, 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 sherpajot. And um, they, do virtually nothing except hang them in these special structures that, that people have where the boards are, there's a slight gap between the boards of the siding. So the wind on these windy small islands can come through and dry the meat that's hanging. And the wind, you know, coming off of the sea on these little islands is salty. So they don't even have to salt the meat. The wind salts the meat for them. Um, um, so, you know, they've figured this out based on their specific um, uh, uh, environmental realities. You can't do that in Santa Rosa, California, or in Woodbury, Tennessee, where I live. Um, um, you know, it, ju it just wouldn't work. So it's a very specific thing in a very specific environment. Um, but, but most of the widespread methods for, for fermenting meat involve... Um, multiple methods. So like, um, um, you know, something like salami involves fermentation. In modern salami production, they use starter cultures, not in traditional uh, uh, um, um, production. Um, in modern uh, uh, salami production, they also add a little bit of sugar to the salami, and, and that's what gives food to the bacteria that create the acidity. There's also drying and there's also salting. And you could preserve meat by heavily salting it alone. You could preserve meat by heavily acidifying it alone. You could preserve meat by drying it alone. 
But instead of doing any of those things in the extreme, the method for making salami does each of those things in moderation and, 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 and relies upon what's called the hurdle effect in the literature. Basically, they're putting three small hurdles and they're keeping the meat safe, but also keeping it, um, you know, sort of soft and not too salty and not too um, um, sour by applying each of the methodologies in moderation rather than one of them in the extreme. Great, thank you. Um, we actually are getting um, up some questions about uh, fermented foods and health. So, um, uh, there's some questions about how helpful to gut function is the consumption of fermented foods, foods and um, also what are your thoughts on fermented foods and migraines? Well, let me just answer that first. I, I, I don't really have, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm, I, I'm not a healer. Like I know about fermentation. I've learned some things about, you know, what fermentation does in our bodies, but I don't really know anything about migraines. And I, I, I can't really, I, I can't really address that. Um, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, fermentation and, you know, gut health, fermentation and digestion, um, I mean, basically, Living fermented foods, by which I mean fermented foods that have not been cooked or heat processed after their fermentation, are rich in living bacteria. And, um, you know, what, what we have learned about, um, you know, about our human bodies, which is really also true for, you know, every multicellular creature that exists, is that, um, you know, bacteria are part of our normal, healthy existence. In the case of our human bodies, you know, every healthy adult is host to mind-boggling numbers of bacteria, something in excess of one trillion. And we don't know the full story of all of the ways in which those bacteria enable us to function, but they enable us to function in many, many different ways. You know, they enable us to effectively digest the food that we eat. They synthesize certain nutrients inside our bodies so we don't have to find them in our food. Um, what we call our immune systems are largely the work of bacteria in our bodies. And they play a role in regulating all kinds of biochemical processes that we're just beginning to appreciate. So for instance, there's a, there, there, there's sort of in the last 10 years, there's a sort of new understanding that serotonin and some of the other compounds that, you know, determine how we think and how we feel are regulated in ways we don't understand yet by bacteria in our gut. But anyway, um, the trillion plus bacteria inside each of us exist in elaborate diversity. Um, but in less diversity than we now can understand that people in the past had. And some of the factors that are leading to diminished biodiversity in the gut are number one, chemical exposure, whether it's antibiotic drugs or, you know, chlorine in our water or agrochemicals or other kinds of chemicals that, you know, we inevitably are exposed to. Number two, changes in our diet. Um, you know, basically uh, uh, people living you know, in modernity, eat much less fiber than people in the past did. And fiber is food for the bacteria all the way along our digestive tracts. Um, so anyway, eating fermented foods can be a strategy for, uh, you know, replenishing biodiversity in the gut. So can eating more fiber in our diet. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I have just heard anecdotal, uh, uh, reports from 
you know, hundreds of people through the years that, you know, after, after, you know, some period of living with chronic digestive problems, you know, they had the idea, somebody suggested to them, they read about to introduce live fermented foods into their diets. You eat a little bit of yogurt or a little bit of kefir, a little bit of sauerkraut, a little bit of kimchi, or maybe all of those things. And, you know, I've just heard so many re reports of, you know, people whose digestion improved. I've been eating these foods my whole life, um, so I never had a moment where they dramatically improved. But sometimes in my travels, I've found myself in situations where I didn't have access to live fermented foods. And I've noticed the opposite, that my digestion really slows down. Um, so, um, so, you know, digestion is, is the, 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 the biggest way in which I've heard about people benefiting, but, you know, there's, there's also um, ways in which we know that the, the bacteria in our guts, um, um, you know, can really stimulate immune function. Um, you know, and all these other ways that bacteria are, um, um, uh, you know, determining how we feel are impacted by eating live fermented foods. And, um, um, you know, I think anyone can potentially benefit from improved digestion, improved immune function, and um, potentially improved mental health. And there's no risk, really. I mean, you know, there, there are people with certain specific health problems who have a hard time um, um, tolerating fermented foods. But, you know, for the vast majority of people, um, you know, it's something that could help and, you know, is not going to have any negative impact at all. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we actually have a question related to that. Um, this person says, when my friend and I homebrewed, we called the yeast the tiny creatures. Curious to hear any other uh, quirky names or cultural or spiritual names that you've encountered for fermentation. I know when I ferment, I call them little dudes. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my friend even made me a sticker that says, feed your little dudes well. And it's a picture of the gut with little yeasties in them. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing that this really makes me think, think of, I mean, I don't have any like, you know, pet nicknames for, for um, uh, you know, the microorganisms that, 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 that I work with, but I, I, you know, I do, you know, I do have, you know, my little um, um, uh, uh, dialogues with them. Um, you know, I talk to them sometimes. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, fermentation is practiced all around the world and, you know, I, it just in so many um, uh, 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 traditions, you know, there is, you know, some aspect of, you know, ritual that attaches to them. So like when I, when I was in um, um, uh, uh, Colombia, um, I went to a, a fermentation festival in Bogota and um, uh there was, um, there were people from, um, you know, a number of indigenous groups participating in it. Um, um, you know, pe some people from uh, 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 the highlands and some people from the Amazon. Um, but this one guy from the Amazon who was making this like incredibly delicious fermented pineapple beverage that was, I mean, it was really just like he was grating pineapple and it was like spontaneously fermented um, pineapple juice. And then he was, uh, he was uh, straining out the, the, the solid residue of it. And, you know, what's not to love about just fresh pineapple juice lightly fermented? I mean, it was incredibly delicious. But what he explained to me is that, you know, the typical context for this ferment, you know, is not like for a refreshing afternoon beverage, but rather for a ritual of like seasonal transition. And, um, you know, it's a whole ritual of appreciation to the pineapple and the pineapple plants and the pineapple deities and, um, um, and, and, and basically the whole community fasts, dances, sings, and for several days only drinks fermented pineapple. Um, and, uh, oh, it's a, a guarapo, guarapo de piña. 
Um, uh, and, um, you know, and that, that's amazing. And that's, you know, that, that's very different from the context in which like I got to sample it. But I think that, you know, in a lot of indigenous communities around the world and historically in a lot more, you know, ferments were just, were, were, they, you know, they, they were just like sort of an extension of people's relationship with the plants that were feeding them. Um, um, and, um, you know, often accompanied by, um, um, you know, elaborate, you know, songs, dances, and other kinds of rituals. Yeah, that it's, yeah, it's amazing just to just go through fermentation journeys and just learn about um, the cultures and traditions around some of these ferments. Um, Let's see, we have a lot of questions about um, preserving fermented products and the viability of pro probiotics when preserved. Like if you're freezing or dehydrating, um, freeze drying. Do you have thoughts sure. on that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the issue with freezing is um, that, you know, like when you put water in the freezer, it expands. Water expands when it freezes. Water in a cell that expands can sometimes cause the cell to burst. So, you know, in general, like, like you know, I, I meet bakers sometimes who like to, you know, back up their um, uh, uh, sourdough starter in the freezer. But if you want to back up your sourdough starter in the freezer, you want to take it and add a lot more flour to it. You want to make it drier. You want to make it denser. Um, you want to make it more solid and less liquid because then you'll have less expansion when it freezes and you'll have greater cell viability uh, uh, when, when you thaw it. So, I mean, that's the issue with freezing is you want anything you, you freeze, you want to, um, uh, you know, remove as much water as possible. Like kefir grains. I've heard of people freezing kefir grains. And then, you know, what, what people often do is they drain the kefir grains, get as much of the liquid off of it as possible. And then sometimes people take powdered milk and... Um, um, uh, shake some powdered milk over the kefir grains to, to remove even more of the liquid part of them um, and then freeze them. Same idea. So you get less expansion and after you thaw it, greater cell viability. Um, in terms of drying, I mean, I think that, you know, as long as you dry at a low temperature, you know, meaning uh, under under 120 degrees Fahrenheit, under 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, the, the, the cells of most organisms used in fermentation um, um, should survive uh, uh, fine. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, 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 uh, you know, dehydration of cultures uh, uh, like that. And then also the refrigerators, you know, for, for you know, short and medium term, uh, 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 preservation um, usually works really well. So there's no need to um, uh, 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 freeze it. So, um, let's see, we've got a question on, um, are there any dessert ferments you can think of? Anything on the sweet spectrum? Sure, but I mean, let me just let me just say that like there's a limitation in fermenting sugar. Anything you ferment with sugar isn't going to stay sweet because the fermentation organisms are going to eat the sugar. Um, so you know, every bit of chocolate anyone watching this is um, has ever eaten is fermented. A chocolate is just always fermented, but it's fermented at the harvesting end. You know, cacao is a seed that is inside a pulpy, juicy, sweet, delicious fruit. And so, um, you know, the first step of, of um, uh, uh, chocolate, like after, after the cacao pods are harvested, they're opened up and the contents of each pod is um, um, uh, uh, removed from the pod. And then what that is, is pulp and the seeds inside the pulp. Well, you know, it, it, it's always fermented as the first step. 
um, um, and that breaks down the pulp and makes it possible in a, a you know labor in in, in a um, you know in a in a not too labor intensive way to just remove the seeds from the remaining uh, uh, pulp and it also develops the biochemistry of the of the seed and and helps develop the you know the the flavor that we all uh, uh, love so much. Um, vanilla is also fermented. Um, so, you know, the, the flavor elements in a lot of um, uh, classic desserts, you know, definitely involve uh, a fermentation. Um, any fruit can be fermented, but it won't say, stay sweet. It'll lose its, its uh, uh, sweetness. Um, you know, one way the fermentation is used for desserts, and I actually have a, a recipe in, in fermentation journeys for an Indonesian version of this. It's called tape. And basically, it uses the enzymes of, well, in Indonesia, the, the, the culture is called ragi, but, you know, we could think of it as, as, an, as an equivalent of koji. And koji is the Japanese name for rice or barley or soybeans grown with a particular fungus, aspergillus or rhizae. Generally, koji is not a food in and of itself, but rather an agent for some kind of fermentation process. Um, um, and, um, and, and, and when we use the koji in fermentation processes, it's not so much that we're growing the koji, it's more that the enzymes that are contained in this fungus break down all kinds of uh, things. So like, you know, one application of koji would be to make sake. Um, um, and in that context, it's the amylase enzymes that are breaking down the complex carbohydrates of rice into simple sugars, which yeast can ferment into alcohol. Um, in, in its application for miso or soy sauce, rather than being primarily the amylase enzymes, there are these protease enzymes that break down proteins into amino acids. And the amino acids tend to be much more flavorful than the proteins from which they are derived. And, and you know, this, this um, Japanese word umami that, that describes like the savory flavor of so many fermented uh, 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 foods, you know, is really the flavor of of, of 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 amino acids that break down from 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 proteins. Um, but anyway, in, to make tape, you use ragi, or you can use um, um, a, a koji, or another version of this, which is much more widely available. Um, uh, uh, they're called Chinese yeast balls. Um, and they're available in, in Asian markets everywhere or, or on the internet. And you sprinkle a little bit of the powder, whether it's from ragi or Chinese yeast balls or koji, onto your cooked uh, starchy substrate. So I, in the recipe in my book for tape, you either use sticky rice or cassava and you steam it, you, co you cook it you know, either way, and then cool it to body temperature. Then you put this little powder on, you know, in, in Indonesia, they typically use banana leaves, but you just loosely wrap it to hold the, the moisture in there. And then you let it ferment. And those enzymes break down the complex carbohydrates of either the sticky rice or the um, uh, cassava and make them very sweet. So it's a short-term fermentation, you know, 12 hours in a warm place, you know, 24 to 48 in a, in a cool place. And, you know, you end up with something really sweet. And if you left it for longer than that, well then, you know, yeast would show up and begin to ferment those sugars into alcohol. But if you, if you sort of eat it at, you know, at, you know, once the sweetening has taken place, then you have something that's, that's very sweet and a beautiful uh, 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 fermented dessert. Thank you. We're getting a couple of questions about um, chi chickpea miso. Have you ever made chickpea miso? Sure, chickpea miso is wonderful. 
is there a question about it or uh, yeah it's it's yeah. just i guess how to make chickpea yeah, miso okay, well, if they said. so what i would say is like if you look in um you know either wild fermentation or the art of fermentation i have you know sort of generic recipes for how to make miso and you know substituting chickpeas for soybeans there's nothing else different about it um, um, and, you know, in fact, you can make, you can make miso out of any kind of beans and, um, you know, more and more, I've been learning that you don't necessarily even need a bean. Um, um, you, you know, certainly like, you know, classic Japanese miso always has a bean and, you know, usually has soybeans and sometimes has, has chickpeas, but, um, um, you know, I, at this point, I've had bread miso that was made with bread and koji. Um, um, I have a miso that is, um, uh, there's a great book for anyone who's interested in, in, in koji. Uh, there's a book called Koji Alchemy, um, um, written by uh, uh, Jeremy Umansky and Rich Shi. And um, when I visited Jeremy's restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio, he gave me a jar um, of miso that's actually made out of the solid remains of cooking chicken stock mixed with miso fermented, or mixed with koji and fermented. And it's shockingly delicious. And, you know, it turns out that miso is an extremely versatile process that, um, um, you know, can be made with many, many, many different substrates. So, um, um, you know, making it with koji is really straightforward. Just find, you know, any miso recipe and just, you know, substitute chickpeas for, for soybeans and um, um, you can make beautiful chickpea miso. Thank you. I know that was a little specific. Um, so we got another question about, uh, this person is interested in hearing more about some of the other fermented foods in indigenous communities around the world. Would you like to share maybe some of your favorites from your travels? Well, sure. Okay. I mean, I mean, another thing that I tried in, um, in Colombia that was amazing was this Amazon uh, 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 ferment called Tucupi. Um, and it's basically the, the juice of cassava. And in, in the Amazon, the way people, so, so cassava uh, uh, is this starchy tuber that originally comes from the Amazon. Now it's, it's sort of an important food in all of the tropical regions of the world. Um, and the challenge with cassava is that in certain soils like the Amazon, uh, like some parts of the Caribbean, like parts of West Africa, it grows with very high levels of cyanide. And the fermentation functions to remove, to break down the cyanide compounds. But the way that they've mostly worked with um, um, cassava in the Amazon is to grate it and then squeeze it, like wring it out and get all the, as much of the juice as possible out. And the, the, the toxins really concentrate in the juice and then people will, will go ahead and, and um, cook with the fibers with the juice removed and make various kinds of breads and pancakes and, and things like that. But with the juice, they ferment it. And even though the toxins concentrated in the juice, it breaks down under fermentation. And once it's fermented, then they'll add some botanical ingredients. Uh, um, 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 the one I tried had ants in it. And then they cook it down, cook it down, cook it down. So they take what was a thin yellowish liquid and it becomes like a black, sticky, tarry substance with so much flavor. It's like sour, it's funky, it's salty. It has like so many uh, 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 tasty elements to it and it's used as a condiment. And so tukupi, I'd never heard of it. And, uh, you know, it's an indigenous ferment coming uh, uh, out of the Amazon. Um, and, um, you know, really, really wonderful. Um, in China, I got to spend some time in um, a, a really rural community 
um, um, you know, inhabited by people of an ethnic minority called um, Dong. And, um, you know, the Dong people that we met were, um, you know, we talked earlier about fermenting with rice. Well, you know, a staple food for them was carp. Fermented. I mean, really, almost every meal we ate in that village, and we were there for four or five days, almost every meal we ate, we were served, you know, just cold and raw, but really delicious fermented fish. And the fish was fermented in a paste of sticky rice, uh, salt, uh, chili, and Sichuan peppercorns. Um, and a little bit of fermented rice, all mixed together in a paste. And then they, they, they have a technique for, for basically opening the fish like a, like a book, like they remove the innards and then they put some of that stuffing in the inside, close it, and then some of the stuffing on each uh, uh, of the exterior sides, and then they stack them in the vessel. Um, um, you know, with that paste uh, in between them, and then they ferment it. You know, it's ready to eat after a month, but but you know, they ferment it for months and and eat it as it goes. Um, and it seems like it's a real staple food there. Um, um, and um, um, you know, it's really it's really wonderful. Um, all of the ferments in the world, like all of the ferments that like you know about and all of the ferments that I know about and all of the ferments you don't know about yet and all of the ferments that I don't know about yet, you know, they're, they're indigenous ferments for somebody. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's all we have. Like nobody's really invented any new fermented foods for, you know, hundreds and possibly thousands of years. Um, but all the fermented foods that we know, you know, are, 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 you know, what indigenous people from somewhere figured out as a strategy for making effective use of, you know, whatever food resources were available to them. Um, I do have a, you know, I, I invited a few people I've met in my travels to sort of contribute small sections to this. And, um, uh, uh, one section is by um, um, a, a woman who I've become friendly with, um, who is a microbiologist from Greenland. And, um, you know, she actually right now is doing a postdoc at um, UC Davis. Um, but um, she contributed a little section about Kiviak which is um, a, a ferment that's indigenous to the northern part of Greenland. And, um, you know, basically people using nets at a moment of the year when, when, when the birds are, are there in Greenland, they use nets and catch hundreds of these tiny birds. And, um, you know, and th then they, they kill the birds just by placing like a thumb over their heart and stopping their hearts. And then they cool, cool the birds' bodies down to ambient temperature. And then they take the skin of a seal and stuff the skin of the seal with these birds and then sew it up and seal it with some whale blubber and then just like leave it under, under some rocks to ferment. Um, and this has been a really important survival food in the, in the north of Greenland. Um, uh, um, and, and so uh, uh, this, this um, you know, lovely, lovely Greenlander woman, uh, Aviaya, uh, wrote a little section in this book with photos and describing, um, um, you know, how, how the process works and, 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 and how it's done. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a question. Um, that says, uh, your kitchen looks amazing. Uh, what are some of your favorite tools to use when fermenting or the ones you use most often? Well, I mean, I love my collection of crocs. I've got, you know, I have all kinds of crocs, you know, my, actually my computer, that my, that my computer's sitting on a croc right now, uh, that's empty, um, um, you know, over, over here is a five gallon croc that's full of um, shoyu soy sauce that I stir every day. Um, um, but, you know, vessels, I mean, the most important tools for fermentation are, are vessels. And, um, you know, just, just to, 
you know, share a perspective on the history of fermentation. I mean, you know, currently, you know, archaeology would date fermentation to 10,000 years ago. Um, you know, because those are the oldest pottery shards that they have found with residue of, um, you know, of, of, of fermentation organisms. But consider this. You know, that only tells us about the, the history of pottery. Um, you know, presumably the earlier vessels that people might have been fermenting in were all um, uh, biodegradable, with, whether they were animal uh, uh, membranes or hollowed out pieces of wood or gourds. Um, but, um, uh, you know, our earliest evidence of fermentation just dates back to, you know, the, 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 the earliest pottery shards that we can find. Um, um, so, so, you know, the, the vessels are extremely important uh, uh, tools and without having something that can hold what you're fermenting, there, there, is, no, there is no ferment. Um, so I think that those are the most important vessels and, you know, honestly, for, for small scale home fermentation, like you don't really need crocs, you know, this is a great tool. This is just a jar. Um, and, you know, in the U.S. it happens that we have great jars compared to most other places in the world and like a wide mouth um, um, mason jar that you know you can just buy in pretty much any hardware store is a wonderful vessel and for fermenting vegetables you can fit about two pounds of vegetables into there um, you know you can you can fit most of your hand in there um, or many people can fit their whole hand in there um, um, and um, uh, uh, this works really well but vessels are the most important I mean, other than that, I mean, really, I'm, I, you know, I use a cutting board and a knife, you know, I mostly, you know, I, I, I try to mostly stay away from, you know, super high tech um, um, tools. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're, you know, if you're trying to make koji or you're trying to make tempeh, then your challenge is, you know, figuring out an environment that can stay between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit for, you know, 24 to 48 hours. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's different ways people do that. You know, I use basically a defunct refrigerator with a incandescent light bulb and a simple fixture at the bottom plugged into a little temperature controller with a sensor. And so, you know, when the sensor gets below 85 degrees, it turns the light bulb on. And when the sensor reaches 85 degrees, it turns the light bulb off. Um, so, you know, that's, that, you know that, that's a like higher technology. For yogurt making, you know, you can buy little dedicated machines you know, that tend not to have the greatest temperature calibration in my limited experience, but I use an insulated cooler and I just preheat it with warm water so it'll like maintain a, a like a warm temperature in the, you know, just above body temperature zone that that, that, that we're trying to, to, to achieve. So really what I'm saying is like most things you can improvise. Um, you know, and again, it gets back to this idea of like, you know, what is the environment that I'm trying to create and just making sure that you understand what the environment is that you're trying to create and then, you know, improvise with the tools that are available to you. I mean, these days people are making all kinds of, you know, amazing high tech tools. I mean, you know, you could now buy, you know, a unit that will make whatever temperature you want. It could make it like, you know, um, you know, 140 degrees Fahrenheit for making black garlic, or it could make it, um, um, you know, know, 115 degrees Fahrenheit to make yogurt, or it could make it 104 degrees Fahrenheit to make natto, or it could make it 90 degrees Fahrenheit to make koji, uh, or it could make it 55 degrees Fahrenheit to, um, uh, uh, you know, make cheese or pure salami. But, you know, that's, you know, I mean, it's probably very expensive. Who has space in their kitchen? And, you know, the entire history of fermentation is, you know, people improvising these things. And also the entire history of fermentation is you can't make everything everywhere. You know, certain things, um, you, you know, can only be made in certain places. Like I was saying about the, the Sherpa Jut in the, in the Faroe Islands. It's just like, you just can't do it anywhere. Um, Anyway, that was a long-winded answer to, to that. That's question. okay. We've got two more questions. Um, okay. Since you were kind of going on that route, do you have some tips for those that are new to fermentation or like an easy um, ferment to start with or, yeah. Sure. Well, first of all, just don't be intimidated. Um, um, you, you know, 
I started with sauerkraut. It's what I recommend as a gateway to fermentation because it's straightforward. You can enjoy your results before too long. It doesn't require um, um, a super specific environment and it's as safe as food gets. Um, um, but you know, there's no ferment that you should be intimidated by. You can make you can make in your kitchen any kind of fermented food or, or, or beverage that, that you want. You just have to make sure that you understand. And this is what my books are all about, trying to explain the conditions that you're trying to create. Thank you. And then we've got, um, we heard you have a picture book that's coming out later this month, um, Sandar Cats in the Tiny Wild. Well, okay, um, let, let me just say like, I, this is not a book by me. This is a book oh. about me. Um, okay. um, and so it's by Jacqueline Briggs Martin and June Jo Lee. It's published by Readers to Eaters. This is a copy of it. Um, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, um, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting and flattering and also a little bit strange to have a children's book written about me, but, um, but there it is. And, um, you know, I hope that the, I, I, I hope that your library system ends up um, getting a copy of it. That is awesome. <laughs> uh, there's, there's actually been some really great picture books published in the last few years about the microbiome. And so it's really exciting to get to see that there are books coming out for the little ones about that. Um, well, thank you, Sandra, for, you know, opening doors to fermentation for so many people. Um, I know folks will walk away from this feeling, you know, inspired and ready to dive in um, and start experimenting on their own. Um, and thank all of you for joining us today. Um, please check out the San Mateo County Library's um, upcoming author events at um, smcl.org slash author talks. Um, and we'd also appreciate it if you could tell us how SMCL did with this program at smcl.org slash rate this event. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you so much.